New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. When you're in comedy, killing is a good thing, right? Well, not always. That's a realization that the three comics touring the vast, lonely land of Western Canada make in the early 1990s through today's story. They discover that the aspiring stand-up that's in their troupe is willing to break a leg on stage, along with an arm, maybe even a neck, if anyone doesn't laugh at his jokes. We'll get the eerie story from an award-winning screenwriter and international Emmy nominee. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. And a special tip of the hat to everybody enjoying our time travel adventure via YouTube. You can find me at historyauthor.com or across social media platforms. Plus, you can read my columns in the New York Sun to get my analysis of current events and some book reviews through the lens of what I've learned from all of these books on the shelves behind me. In this episode, our time machine welcomes aboard a very special guest. It's Brent Butt, and those of you in the Great White North know him from the sitcom Corner Gas. He's the creator, the writer, he stars in the show, and it was so beloved by Canadians that they brought it back in an animated series. Corner Gas is a great show, but for those of you in the U.S. who are unfamiliar with it, I could see a day coming in 10 years when somebody looks at Brent Butt and says, wait a minute, that great thriller author is also a comedian? You can find him at Brent Butt on Twitter, is also the host of the Butt Pod, that's B-U-T-T-P-O-D, and also on Substack, the Brent Butt Substack. We're going to laugh until we scream with Brent Butt's debut novel, Huge. And here we are with Brent Butt. He's one of Canada's national treasures, and he's joining us from Vancouver to chat about his very first novel. It's called Huge. Thank you so much for making the time to chat with the History Author Show, sir. No, it's my pleasure. Thanks for the invite. So I asked for a copy of the book, and I wouldn't have you on if I didn't like it, and there's a little bit of nervousness when I first opened it up, but you knocked it out of the park. And Thank you. (laughs) So, Well, you're welcome. I only tell the truth. I I wish I could lie better, but I can't. But this book is a first effort that could have been your 10th or 12th, and it doesn't seem like something where, oh, I have a bunch of novels in the drawer. I finally got the fourth published. I like the idea of people saying now they think you're quote unquote, just a comic because, and they're shocked by this. And maybe you've gotten Mm -hmm. some backhanded compliments and I can tell by how your mind works that those things stick in your head and you say, well, you don't realize that good fiction requires the same attention to detail, requires timing. And you have to be, as you describe yourself, a fan of the language here, hear little words, maybe on a sitcom or a TV show 50 years ago. And you say, I can use that here. So what has that reaction been like from people who don't know you as a writer beyond the comedy writing and don't think maybe that that's the same as putting words down, even though it's a laborious process and you're using all those same muscles, just expanding them and working out in a different way? Well, I think people tend to, I think, pretty naturally look at comedy and, you know, horror, for lack of a better word, comedy and horror as being very polar opposite things, but they really are in, in the classic sense of the word, two sides of the same coin. They're really, I, I often describe them as not so distant cousins. They're both sort of a twisted reaction to an unexpected event. And, um, so, so there structurally, there are some very similar elements between comedy and like, we're trying to make somebody laugh or trying to make somebody afraid. There are some very similar elements that are involved in, in that recipe, you know? So there are some people who, you know, we're not surprised at all that a, a person who's known for being funny could also craft something that was kind of dark and scary. Um, especially people inside the comedy community. There's a lot less of a surprise from people inside the comedy community because they're well aware of the levels of darkness that are sort of stewing (laughs) in that mix naturally. But it's, it's people who aren't that familiar with comedy that, uh, you know, look at comedy from the outside that are a little surprised. I think that, uh, especially because my comedy is sort of known for being, um, you know, pretty approachable. It's pretty, (laughs) it's pretty, 
you know, I'm not an edgy, controversial comedian. Um, and so I think the fact that this book is sort of dark and violent and, uh, you know, has its share of uh, nastiness, I think that surprised some people who are not familiar with how comedy works. Yeah, I was thinking of, as you're saying that, the actor who played Skippy, he's also a comedian on uh, Family Ties. And right. he had a very inoffensive character. And then he went up and did stand up one time I was seeing him and he said, I know there's little old ladies at home going, Skippy? I, how this is the negative you know, he's cursing yeah. he's saying I mean, he wasn't a, he wasn't a dirty comic by any any stretch but people identify you one way and then you you put this out it's a little different because it, someone but someone picks up your book and my wife picked it up and she was just she was just shocked by the first chapter mm -hmm. she said wow this is really in, in a good way that's what you want when you're reading a r when you're reading a thriller yeah. but he said it's, it's really a, a punch in the face and it's tough and that's something that you've talked about in your comedy career too you say if you have them laughing in the beginning of the set you know you you have them and then you approach it a different way and you know if you're dying but you can rewrite is the great thing about a novel so how did you go about that how did you go about that beginning and saying okay I'm going to approach this. Maybe you weren't conscious of that. Just like I do a set and say, I've got to hook these people at the beginning and get them to keep reading. Well, really, I had some fantastic advice from a very accomplished, you know, number one New York Times bestselling author, Linwood Barkley. He and I follow each other on social media. We hadn't met at this point. We just realized that we were sort of fans of each other's work. He was a fan of my TV show and I read his books and I think he's such a fantastic thriller writer. Anyway, we got to know each other just a little bit on social media. So when I was finished the, an early draft of my novel, I thought, you know, I sort of worked up the the moxie to say to him, hey, if I sent you this manuscript, any chance you might read it and give me your thoughts or notes? And he said, yes, yeah, send it over. And he was the one who who said, you know, he was quite complimentary about the the book, even that early first draft. But he had some constructive criticism up throughout it but he also said specifically about that first chapter he said you know it's fine but in this day and age uh you know you you really just have that first chapter to hook somebody to make them want to read more and he said i i recommend you go back and really think about how you can make this first chapter more weird make it weird make people like hook them pull them in and it was fantastic advice so i went back and i i looked at it in in that light i looked at the first chapter sort of how can i give it a very weird twist and i also thought how can i make it a little more thematic to what the whole novel is about um and so it it ended up being you know i i really like that first chapter and i have a lot of people commenting about the, how quickly they got pulled into the book by that first chapter um but it wasn't you know it was really at the advice of, of a, a seasoned literary professional who said Go back and rework this and, and think about how you can make this better. Yeah, I'll probably mention it a few times here, but as someone who's tuned into a lot of the mistakes first time authors make, you avoided a lot of them by that editing process and by sometimes they'll tell an author, move up that third chapter to the beginning. That's when all the excitement happens. And first time authors tend, and, and you're not a, a novice writer, but as far as this genre, you dove into it and you got people hitting the ground running and I don't want to give anything away, but there's a sense of darkness there and a darkness, yeah. not just of what's inside this character, but in huge, you, you can't see, and you replicate that so well, some of feeling like you're with this man, knowing there's this menace, not knowing what it is. It could be, could be a werewolf. It could be anything that's <laughs> there, a vampire, but you know, it's a threat and you know, it's probably not those things supernatural, but you evoke those in us as readers where we're thinking, we know it's something bad. And that's when in the darkness, your mind starts playing tricks on you and it becomes thrilling. It becomes scary. And that's something you evoked in a way that you wouldn't, I guess, in comedy, or you would do it maybe as in a, in a joking way. It would be yeah, maybe you more just of a do it sort of You do it sort of differently in comedy. You, you use people's imagination um, as a tool in your toolbox because uh, the imagination is a powerful, powerful thing. And if you can tap into somebody's imagination, you know, there's no, there's no better weapon for lack of for lack of a better word. And so with comedy, you do it in a way where you make them anticipate something. You make them think they know where the joke or the story is going to go, and you hang a very sharp left. So you've used their brain's ability to process 
and create to surprise them by creating something else. And you sort of do the same thing with, um, you know, with suspense or with terror. You use people's imagination against them. There's no more powerful engine than the human brain. So it, it makes sense to, if you're telling a story, to tap into the listener's or the reader's imagination. Two ways to go with that. And one of them is that idea of you had a much bigger word count here to work with when you wrote huge, of course. But yeah. another item that when I read the book, I I just it's the kind of thing in a book, if it was an apple, I would take a big bite out of it. And it was when you you have your your main character whose last name is huge. And the word huge has many meanings to it there in layers, which is another sign of, of great writing. Every word has to carry as much as possible. But you have him refer to an owl's toenails. And to yeah. me, I I when you admire a writer, but you don't see those. Well, you're, you're an illustrator, right? You have the life in heck. Is that the heck on earth? Heck on earth. I'm sorry. I was confused yeah. with Matt Groening's life now. I could see that the hand there, how well it was done, but it's not as if there's the early pencil sketches where you're having a tough time drawing Hulk's hand when you're a kid. And so you go, right. oh, well, maybe I can have Hulk have his hand through a wall. That's a good solution, <laughs> right? So I, cause I can't yeah. draw the hands, but that is, of course you, I, I know from listening to the butt pod, your podcast, that your company is named Sparrow Media and that has a, a personal representation there, which is another level. People have to go listen through all the butt pods. You'd be glad you did <laughs> to, uh, to get that reference, why you chose Sparrow. And so I said, I know that he knows that, of course, a bird has talons, not toenails. But toenails is such a gross thing. Like you, know, you think of a E. Cummings, he, you know, he never put toenails in a poem. It's just not in there. And so yeah. you chose that to have a little bit of a creepy moment. And so I wanted to ask for moments like that. Was it the dialogue in comedy? How did you get their voices where they each really are distinctive and it allows you to avoid another mistake of first time authors where you didn't constantly use speech tags, try to punch it up there. Each character has a distinctive voice, even though Rin, we can't hear her Irish accent. We know every time she's talking. You know, with Hobie specifically, I, I want to show that he is somebody who misses the mark a little bit. He's somebody who, um, you know, he has all kinds of confidence, but he's just off the mark a little bit and calling the, you know, he, and plus he's heated at the moment. He's angry that the owl scratched the paint on his van and, you know, he scratched it all up with his toenails. That just struck me as a, um, it didn't strike me right. I think that actually the first time I wrote is, uh, I wrote talons and I thought, well, he, Hobie wouldn't say talons. That wouldn't be in his, his, his verbal repertoire right there handy, especially in a heated moment. And claws didn't seem quite right. And I just wrote toenails and it actually kind of made me laugh. And it seemed to really fit in that scenario for, for Hobie to be mad at this bird for scratching his paint with his toenails. <laughs> um, so, so I'm a big believer that if you, if you, and maybe it doesn't work this way for everybody, but it works this way for me. If you get to know your characters through the process of writing, which is, what I do, I tend to really, I tend to overwrite and then find the stuff that works and, you know, find the path that you want to go down. But it, it all sort of comes from overwriting. Um, and, and you find out about your characters just from little things that they say or little things that they, that they do as you're writing. Um, and yes, it's you creating this, but it, it's hard to explain to people who don't do it, how sometimes you're writing something and you'll, you'll be writing dialogue for a character. And something will just come out and, you know, of course it came from your brain, but it surprises you, especially if you, especially if you type fast, which I do. <laughs> Sometimes it's like your brain is just a bit ahead. One part of your brain is a bit ahead of another part of your brain and it plants the seed. And then the other part of your brain goes, wow, really? You, you find things out <clears throat> about your characters, you know, through especially through through chatting especially through dialogue uh, oftentimes that dialogue gets peeled back but it's a great way to uh, you know i recommend it to people if they want to know their characters just write your character or two of your characters in a conversation about something and you'll start to you'll start to know your characters you'll start to understand how what they feel about things based on just a lot of dialogue that you're ultimately not going to end up using but it's like panning gold, right? You you got to go through the silt and the mud and the rocks 
And then every now and then you go, oh, I'll keep that. That's a nice shiny <laughs> bit. Reminds me of Stephen King and how he described it. If you read his book, Dance Macabre, on uh, writing fiction, on, on the genre of fiction, really, it's not a how-to book, but I, I read it in Dog Eater when I was younger. About the time this book takes place, which is in the early 1990s, so there's your bit of history there as I break genres. But he said, they said, how do you write? And he did exactly what you described. He says, I just keep writing what they're saying, and I maybe I'll write myself into a corner, and then one of the characters just will reach up out of the page and step up to my desk and say, oh, what are you working on? And I say, I don't know, but can you help me with this? I don't know where it's going. And they'll help you along, which sounds just as 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 creepy, maybe, as people who feel reading the <laughs> book and wonder if, uh, like in Stranger Than Fiction, that suddenly uh, Hobie Huge might show up at their house, huh? Yeah, hopefully they get that feeling. I would yeah. love for people <laughs> to have the feeling that they maybe didn't want to go out to their vehicle just in case Hobie <laughs> was there. Uh, that's That's what you look for. Uh, you, you want to affect your reader or your viewer in the case of TV or film. You want to, you want to affect them in that way, for sure. I did for me. I know that I when I, from reading uh, Salem's Lot, I remember <laughs> when I first read Salem's Lot, being very wary about looking out the window at night, like yeah. <laughs> what you might see floating there. Um, that affected me for a long time. Yeah. After I read Huge, I walked into a hotel room and I smelled it freshly cleaned. And it reminded me of huge. So little okay. details like that where you touched every sense. Another thing that's so important in writing all happens. And I'm aware I'm teasing people out there, but that's the idea because the book is, it's just special because you come from somewhere else. And that's something I also wanted to, to bring up because you have this notion perhaps among people that like Paul Reiser said, if there was a grapefruit, they took a grapefruit, they put it on TV for 20 hours a week and, you know, a few hours every night, and then they took it out in public, you'd have guys elbowing their wives saying, hey, that's the grapefruit from TV. It's a famous grapefruit <laughs> now. And I think people might get that idea. They might think that that's how publishing works, but it certainly wasn't for you. And I know from knowing people that write, it's not a given that people will want to give you a contract to write another book. You, you have to work yeah. just as hard at it. So I, I want to make sure people understand that and hear the great work you put into it to hear somebody who loves what they do is just a great thing for you to share and that's something you did during the pandemic you just said i'm going to sit down and hammer it out and see what happens and you you really you hit that nugget of gold with this book oh well thank you very much yeah it was really a case of like i knew i always i always knew that i wanted to write a novel or i wanted to try to write a novel i didn't know if i'd be able to um but I knew I was going to give it a whirl. And I also didn't know if I would like it. But I had spent, prior to sitting down to write huge, I had spent about 25 years writing scripts, TV scripts mostly, a couple of feature film scripts, some sketch stuff. But, you know, principally writing for television and writing my stand-up. And I knew this was going to be a much bigger animal to tackle. Uh, but I also knew I was going to give it a whirl. And when the pandemic came around, I thought now's the time. I'm just going to sit down and start writing and see what happens. But I also, having come from that background of scripts, you know, I'm a big believer in structure. I'm a big believer in a framework, a framework that allows you to, you know, have a place that you want to start writing to, a place that you want to get to, and you discover things along the way. And you may even, through the process of discovery, decide that the point you were getting to isn't right but you'll come up with a new point. But the idea is I don't like to just sit and ramble, you know, in a complete fog of discovery. I do like to have a bit of purpose. I, there's a pragmatism to my day when, you know, uh, I, I want to write to something. I want to do a thousand words a day and I want to get to a certain point in my story by the end of the week. And you know, I have that target and I have that structure. I, I structure at least the first half of my story. I usually have, you know, I break it. I tend to break stories down into 12 sections, 12 points. So I start with that framework, but then within, within that skeleton, within that framework, I don't know what's going to happen. And a lot of my favorite things in the book, I would say actually all of my favorite things in the book were things that were discovered in between those structured points just you know, like knowing where I want to go. So I have that direction and then start fleshing it out and, you know, overwriting. Like if I know a section is going to be like 8,000 words or something, I might write 12, 
15,000 words to get that 8,000 down. You talk about the idea of overwriting, and it makes me think, again, of Stephen King, another of his books, Misery. And then I thought of King of yeah. Comedy with uh, Rupert Pupkin, of course, oh, yeah. and he's you know, <laughs> Didero in there and taking taking over and thinking that he should be the guy. And this is yet another thing you, you avoided doing where the work doesn't just seem to be, I guess, derivative is what the really smart, pretentious people say. But it didn't seem like you just copied that from anywhere. And it seemed as if this is something that it comes to you very fresh, very new, and that there may be some influences in your life. But one of the things that crosses over there, this, this Rupert Pupkin, that idea and in misery is you meet people when you're on the road, and especially now who feel they know you. And this is something if people are watching on YouTube, I have Doc Emmerich's book over here, the NHL announcer. And when I was going to interview him, and he's just the nicest guy in the world, I said, okay, I've watched thousands of hockey games with this guy, and he's never met me. And so for huge, I thought, is there part of that that comes to you? Other comics on the road is part of it, where people come up to you, and maybe it's a little jarring, little things like they know your dog's name. And then you have to remember, I put that on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Or they come up to you and say, I wrote this great book, you, or you should do this plot on Corner Gas. You've got to, why did you? And then maybe they come back and say, why didn't you do it? And it's a little off-putting. So what were some of those moments where maybe all of us just think of the the glamour and the, the glitz of, of being a comic and it's all laughs all the time that give you this idea to look at that darker side? I'm picturing you sitting in the passenger seat of a car out in some road between Brandon and Winnipeg and thinking you know, they could just dump me anywhere along here and they won't even find mm -hmm. me till the thaw. Yeah, well, there is there is that dark side of it. There's uh, there's I mean, a lot of comedy comes from a dark place. Uh, uh, I want to make sure that I emphasize that I don't think it all comes from a dark place. Uh, I'm not a big proponent of, you know, in order to be funny, you have to suffer. But I know that a lot of suffering can create good comedy. But there, there is, especially in those early days when you're first starting out, and it's something I wanted to do with this book, is I wanted to really peel back the curtain a little bit as to how unglamorous it really is when you're... You know, you're performing in venues where they don't even know there's going to be comedy that night. They forgot all about it. They're against the idea that, you know, the manager, the but like, I can't even tell you how many times we've gone into a place, you know, in the early days. And it's like, hi, we're the comedians for the show tonight. And they're like, ah, is that tonight? <laughs> like, it's the, the last thing they want. <laughs> it's the last thing the crowd wants. And you got to go up. And it's like comedy against your will, you know. And you, but, but it really, it, it makes you strong it, and it, it teaches you a lot of things. Um, there's a lot of bombing and a lot of scrambling for your, uh, life. Sometimes literally there have been, there have been nights when we, myself and the other comics have found another way out of the place just to avoid certain groups of people in the venue. So there is all that kind of dark romance you know, I think there's a sinister side to putting yourself out there, no matter what you're doing. But the flip side of it is to to not put yourself out there, and then I think you're I think you're missing something in life. Yeah, you have to take those chances. Then sometimes you get a great book out of it, which you certainly did. And again, I, I want everybody to know at home, probably people who watch do, but certainly you, Brent, to know. I guess just as much over little old ladies who wrote books on first ladies of the United <laughs> States. So this is not, I'm trying to execute my host duties here and not just sound like I admire you. But as a writer, I just really love what you've done. And I always encourage first time writers. And in fact, one thing huge made me very scared about was you may not write another novel. And so I don't want to ask because I would like to read the second, <laughs> but I'll force myself. Are you thinking about writing again? Or, or do you think uh, now with the world opened up again, you probably are going to go back to the other kinds of writing you enjoyed? I'm well into my second novel already. Um, I, I, I <laughs> love the process. Like I said, off the start, uh, off the start, I didn't know whether I would a be able to do it or b even enjoy it. But what I found was I absolutely loved it. After you know, twenty five years of writing scripts, which are very, very structured, um, to have the freedom to just to just flow and let the story go where you feel it naturally should go, and shape it afterward, it was it was I can't impress it upon you how much I enjoyed that. And it wasn't long after 
I was happy with huge and I had it out, you know, to the publisher that I started on my next novel. I was, I was sort of champing at the bit. This one's already in its second printing, isn't it? Of huge. Is it the second printing they're doing? Yeah. They, they, because it, it debuted on the Canadian uh, bestseller list on the national fiction list as a national bestseller. October 3rd was the book launch. That was publication day. So it, it published October 3rd and October 4th, there was a new print run added amazon asked for more and um and it, we found out that it made the bestseller list from so an instant bestseller because of the pre-orders so that was pretty pretty exciting day to, to go through the launch october 3rd that was pretty heady because i'd never done that before with it being my first book and um we had a fantastic book launch event here in vancouver at a great uh, refurbished old theater called the hollywood theater and it was a you know, it couldn't have gone any better. So I was already over the moon with how the publication day went. And then to get that news the day after second print run and um, the bestsellers list, it was pretty, pretty fantastic. And the, and yeah, the feedback from, from readers like yourself uh, and, and others has been very, very encouraging. Well, you certainly earned it. Well, thank you. You're enjoying my conversation with Brent, Butt. he's the author of huge, a novel. Please do visit our guest on Substack. I will tell you, I have never subscribed to a Substack before, but after having a look, as somebody who's in the media and used to getting freebies on this stuff, we tend to be pretty cheap. It's a big deal for me to, <laughs> to break that taboo and go ahead and pay for it, but it's well worth it. I can already tell I love all of the content that Brent Butt puts out. You could still catch him on Twitter, although he's trying to wean himself off. And please do subscribe to the Butt Pod to make yourself laugh, but also make yourself more, more smarter. smarter. And for those of you who don't get that <laughs> reference, again, you'll just have to listen to the show. And you'll have to read his book, of course, to get more scareder, which is something I just invented. <laughs> and I'll probably best leave the comedy to you. But this is a fantastic book. Let me, don't take my word for it here. I have a quote from Meredith Hambrock, author of Other People's Secrets. And she calls Huge darkly funny, but with an awesomely terrifying arc. Kept me reading way later than I wanted to. Now, Brent, I had the same experience, and today, with all the distractions we have, this is not me back in 1993 on one of those long road trips that you describe in Huge. I have my phone, I have the TV, I have um, outside. I you, There's so many distractions coming. My wife, not that she would ever be a distraction, as your wife Nancy, I'm sure, is not a distraction. Very supportive in our writing. He's a I tremendous sure. distraction. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Mine or yours? But, my uh, wife is a tremendous distraction <laughs> in all the best ways, though. <laughs> no, you're a, a lovely, lovely couple. It's, it's great to see you two together and working together. But this book kept my interest that way. It kept me wanting to read it. And I said, what a great feeling. It's a feeling I hadn't felt for a long time. And I've, I've read, obviously, I've done other novelists here. And I, that's, but that's also has history in it. This was, I mean, to me and you, 1993 probably doesn't seem that long ago, even though it's 30 years. I know. But when, when people sit down and they, they watch that stand-up set or they sit down for a sitcom or a hockey game they're planting their drink in their hand they probably have a two three drink minimum and entropy is on your side whereas with a novel the easiest thing to do in the world is to put it down if you don't catch them in that first chapter if you don't keep them hooked throughout and they never pick it up again so yeah. how did you learn what you learned in those venues because you're not hearing the feedback from the audience when when they're reading a book they're not laughing they're not cringing at that at something in the first chapter of course i'm sure you have your wife nancy read it and you had this feedback from a friend no she didn't read it until it was <laughs> oh, published. really she refused oh, wow. yeah oh, wow. <laughs> it was just her way of saying like um she was going to read it and then she said no i want to read it when it's published and it became a thing she sort of dug her heels in and it was almost <laughs> like willing the book to get published yeah, she knew someday it was going to be in print and she'd be able to, that's a great thing to hold the book in your hands too. Yeah. But, but so how did you use those experiences? A little bit of a long question, but to keep readers that you couldn't see, that you couldn't hear how they were reacting, they weren't going to be booing you. How did you keep them turning those pages so we kept reading? Yeah, I mean, you have to rely on your instincts a, a little bit. And it's one of the things that I'm I'm grateful for is like doing stand up for as long as I have, like I started doing stand up in 1988. So it's been about 35 years of being a, a comedian. And over that time, you develop an instinct for how the crowd is going to react or 
whether or not they're going to react to something. And you sort of just, I mean, stand up is a great, it's, I know that there are other genres that probably have the same thing, but I'm just speaking through what I know, like with stand up, it'll be you and another comedian on the road and you'll be making each other laugh as you drive into the next town and you're cracking each other up and you say a hundred funny things, but none of them retain in your head. But then somebody will say something and we'll both go, Oh, that could go in the act that could. And, and you just develop an instinct for the difference between, okay, this is situationally funny here and now, and that's a thing that could be become part of a stand-up act. That could be a joke in a professional comedy bit. Um, and you, and you start, you develop an instinct again, just over years and years of doing it. And I think you do have to have some natural ability in this regard, but you work it, you work this, um, like a muscle. And you start to realize like, okay, this could be funny, but that's too wordy. Uh, there's too many words. I got to get to the funny part sooner. And you start carving bits out. Um, or some, you know, you'll, you'll say something, you'll try a bit out as you're driving and you'll say, oh, I have two double O sound words back to back there. That sounds goofy. I got to pick a different word. Otherwise that's going to derail it. Cause a lot of people don't realize how delicate comedy is, how many reasons there are for a joke to not work. And your biggest job, I think, as a comedian, and it translated to when we were doing Corner Gas, I felt like my biggest job was to target the things that are going to get in the way. And sometimes people think you're being precious. I would have directors sometimes when I would say, I would see the blocking, I would watch the monitor, and I would say, can you have that person in the background move like two tables farther back? Because they're just pulling a little bit of your attention away at a time when it shouldn't. And they'd be like, oh, okay. But the difference can be, I remember specifically one time we were, there was a, a gag on corner gas where it was in, in a bit of a fantasy and we needed a, a bike horn honk. And so the editor had put in a bike horn honk and I said, that's good. But anyway, I think we could find a funnier bike horn honk. Do you have like a bunch of them there? And he said, yeah, I got a bunch of them there. And I said, let's just run through them. Like honk a bunch of these. And he's like, really? Like a bike horn honk is a bike horn honk. I said, no, like one of them will be funnier than the others. Let's just go through them. And so we went through them honking, honk, 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 honk. And I picked, I said, that one right there, put that one in. And he's like, all right. He put it in. We, we rewatched the scene and he broke up laughing. And then he stopped almost angry. And he said, why the hell did that work? Why is that funnier than the other one? I said, I don't know why exactly, but I know it is. And it's yeah. just something you develop an instinct. And so when you're writing scripts or when you're writing a novel, I, I learned especially, you're really sitting there by yourself. And and for me, I rely on the, you know, tens of thousands of minutes of time I spent talking to people, trying to elicit a specific reaction and learning from when it didn't work, learning from when it did work, filing it away. And it becomes an instinct you rely on. I'm also very open to, you know, working in TV and film, it's very collaborative. It's very much a team sport. So I'm, I'm very open to getting another set of eyeballs on something and looking at it and saying, what do you think? How, how could this be better? How, you know, I, I'm not precious in that regard. I, I love input from people. I mean, I don't always love it, but I'm, I'm always open to it. Yeah, another another perspective. And you get that from the characters as well when you're writing. And I like that little bit of a relationship that Dale has, very, very similar to an author helping another author. He's trying to mentor this younger comic and tell him what works and doesn't. And I, I just love the mechanics of things like that and of the writing and yeah. of the performing. So that was great. But then he realizes, whoa, you and I've, I've had this happen now that I'm uh, about the same age as you. You know, you get older and sometimes you try to help a young person and then you realize, oh, honestly, sometimes you get burned. But you want to still offer because for me, anyway, I remember what it was like when I was young and I was in uh, veterinary medicine. I, I was a veterinary technician and then to jump into the world of television and then news, I didn't really know much. I mean, having my hand inside a schnauzer really never came up anymore <laughs> as a useful thing. So I, I had to do all that. But you, uh, you I look at had my, I was just elbow deep in a schnauzer <laughs> just before the show. <laughs> a giant miniature or <laughs> that's like, I won't even get, but the, uh, the editing and the idea of what doesn't work reminded me of young frankenstein and when mel brooks had that first screening of it and the audience didn't really like it and he said well 
wait, come back in a week. I'm going to, I'm going to edit it and you'll love it. You'll be cracking up. And the whole thing, how he insisted on having it in black and white. And the, the studio tried to trick him and said, let's shoot it in color and we'll just drop the chrome out. We'll take out the color. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, right. They're still going to want to release it in color. You, you have the power when you're in charge of comedy. That's what you ask for in corner gas. But here as a novelist, you have so much freedom and creative control that that must be very liberating compared to when you know you have a script and you're just going to hand it off to other actors, but also you don't get that same collaboration. You can't hand it to one of your talented actors on corner gas and say, Oh, they just, the way they said that little word was, was funnier. So that that's something that uh, must've been, uh, I wonder how long it took you, I guess, is my question to, to adjust to that and realize that this audience that you couldn't see, you couldn't meet this beast and walk out there, look at the crowd. You had to imagine those, people that were going to be your readers and try to hit them without knowing it. And also know that once again, as in standup, you were going to be alone. Yeah. Well, I, it, like I said, it all just comes back to instincts. I mean, even with corner gas, we didn't have an audience with corner gas. Um, it was a single camera shoot. So it was like, it was like doing a, a movie. There was no audience. And so again, you, you have to rely on, you know, you hear something said and you have to decide whether you think that's going to get a laugh or it's going to get the reaction you wanted, or it's not based on just sort of your gut having first, having written it, read it out loud, you kick it around. You often try different phrasing on things till you come up with the thing you land on and you're relying on your gut. And then you hear somebody, an actor say it, and you rely on your gut about like, well, maybe that needs to just be faster or maybe, you know, but with corner gas, by the time, you know, we were, a few episodes into it the the actors were so good with their characters they really you know they they were nailing it all the time but yeah you just have to rely on your instinct when you have no audience but luckily i have the, all those years of working with an audience to to rely on and i've kind of honed those instincts to where they work more often than they don't they still miss sometimes but they land more often than they don't once you put this to bed, a huge as a novel, I'm imagining there's so many words in it compared to a script where you're forced to have a deadline when you have a certain time to go on a TV, that's it. And here you put it to bed, send it to the publisher. Was that a different feeling to know when it was done? Because you'd never written a novel before to just put it to bed and say, I'm ready to hand it to the publisher. Well, I sort of knew that it would be a similar process as it is with TV where, you know, I, I've written it to where I like it and you send it off um, and you're going to get network notes back. And then that's a bit of a negotiation sometimes where you explain why you don't want to take their note or if it's a good note, you take the note, you know, it's a, so there's, there's sort of never that moment where I sort of wash my hands of it and say, well, I can't get any better than that. It's just the reality of um, at a certain point, you got to go to press. At a certain point, you got to go to the camera. And so there comes a time just from a practical standpoint where it's like, okay, we're done with that now. But up until that point, there's often tweaking. And um, so when I, you know, and I was sending this book off in stages. I, I first sent it to my manager to see what she thought, then um, sent it out to get a literary agent, see what they thought. Uh, and then, you know, my literary agent had notes. So I made some tweaks based on my literary agent's input. We sent it to a publisher when we made the deal with the publisher, you know, they had some thoughts and notes and you make little tweaks. And then the, the editor, you know, there's an editor that gets assigned to it. They read through it and they make suggestions and you take some of the suggestions, you know, you, you don't take others. And, and, um, you know, it's, it's still a process, but so there, there just comes a point where, yeah, we're done because the press is fired up here and we, we're going to get it on trucks by, you know, the end of September. It's got to go now. And so at that point, you're done with it. If that deadline didn't exist, I'm sure I would be futzing with huge today. I would still be, even if I'm writing something else, I'd be, if I looked at huge, I'd go, I could I'd come up with a better sentence there or something. You can always, you can futz stuff to death for sure. Dale reflects in huge that quote comedy isn't reality. It's a distorted funhouse mirror reflecting reality in twisted, ridiculous ways. Which of those realities made you say that's something that I want to twist. And you said, boy, I've, I've got to get that in there because 
my wife, as I mentioned here, I think off the air, was musical director at Second City around the time that you were you were in that same area and in that same scene. And she said so, so many of those things in huge ring so true. So some of those twisted ways, some of those ridiculous ways of looking at things. How did you look at your two comics? I assume that would be a little bit easy and make make Dale and Rin believable and see things a certain way. And, oh, he's always writing. He has that, that mental notebook there to write things down. But then how do you get in the head of somebody who is just not seeing funny in the right things and becomes this menacing character throughout the course of the book? I think, you know, maybe not to the extreme that Hobie is, but we all encounter menacing people in our lives. And we, you know, we encounter people who, you know, they think they have something, they think they know how stuff is figured out and, but they maybe don't have. And um, some people are very, aggressive on their stance on things as opposed to being open-minded on on things and some people are also you know very physically intimidating in one way or another so we've all we i think we've all encountered people like that and i know in my history working on the road with comedians there there have been a number like 99.9 percent .9 of the time it's terrific but every now and then you will get saddled with somebody that you were like man you know if we weren't booked together on this this thing, you're not somebody I would even want to talk to because I think you are dangerous and uh, untrustworthy and <laughs> full of bad decisions. And, um, you know, those, those people are out there and sometimes you get saddled with them and sometimes you've got to spend two weeks with them. And so you, you know, I just, I, I drew on that and then just sort of expound on it. Like I never had anybody, clearly I haven't been on the road with anybody as, off the mark as Hobie is, but there have been people who are very questionable and people that I thought, I wonder what this guy does in his own time. What does this guy do when no <laughs> one's around, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. And then you just sort of extrapolate, right? The, the essence of storytelling is embellishment, they say. So it's, it's sort of, you know, storytelling is a lot of what if, and you just start saying, well, what if, what if this person was capable of doing this? How you, you start asking the questions, well, how, how far would this person go? And if you were put in this situation, what would you do? How scared would you be? How willing to push back would you be? How, how quick would you be willing to, you know, roll over and submit? You, you, you just start asking yourself questions. That's what I do anyway. That plays on your mind a little bit. And do you, you also don't show your hand in some other places. I meant showing your hand. So I wanted to, to ask a question because in huge, you have Rin and she wonders at one point if she's in an Agatha Christie novel, you have uh, another point where Dale says, we're not Superman and Wonder Woman here. Maybe it's her, I, but uh, they, and I know you're a big comic book fan there. So for me, I might be a little self-conscious and say, people will see my hand, but I would also want people to know I wrote the book probably. This is assigned to me. You even name check Bob Newhart, the great Bob Newhart. So <laughs> I knew right away, this was not a ghost writer who wrote this for you. Uh, Brent Bunt did all the work, but how, how did you keep those actions grounded? So you weren't breaking that fourth wall because I think, of Jackie Gleason, he did it once and it wasn't, it was really at the end of a honeymooners and he, they came out and thanked the crowd. I think it was at Christmas. Whereas you had Alan Hale, who I also love a skipper on Gilligan's Island. And when we were kids, we just howled when he would look at the camera and in exasperation yeah. with Gilligan and say that he was in on the joke. So as a writer, how do you make it clear that you're, that you're not winking too much? How did you find that, that muscle or it may not have even been a concern to you, but I was curious. I don't know that I was ever sort of really winking in a knowing way, in a Oliver Hardy kind of way, or Stan Laurel, which was the one that broke the... Uh... But yeah, I, I mean, I make mention of things that are, you know, I think pretty much a frame of reference for it. Like anybody, like Bob Newhart, like you said, um, it, it sort of comes up in a very organic way. The, you know, Dale is quoting something that he heard Bob Newhart say about stand up. So within the context of the situation and the scene that they're in, you know, it's all pretty, it's pretty organic. I'm trying to think if there were times when I sort of, I mean, the fact that the comedy club is called Whispers in Winnipeg um, and the comedy club I used to play in Winnipeg all the time is called Rumors. It's little things like that for people who are kind of inside the comedy community might 
and there are a lot of people that think they know who Hobie is based on. Everybody's got a different idea. And it's like, it's not based on any one person, but yeah, I don't, I don't know to what degree I was w winking at anybody really. I mentioned about you being a fan of comic books and uh, that little line there. You also managed, though, not to draw on your comic book experience in the sense that they never turn into Aurora and Sasquatch from Alpha Flight on page 30. And you say, well, that's not realistic. These are just two regular people. You put yourself, I suppose, very much in that situation in the sense that this is really what would happen. It wasn't something where you said, I set out to show that people are going to have they're they're gonna find and reach deep down inside and they're gonna find the strength to lift a car like the incredible hulk it was going to be something very real and i, I wonder if that was also a goal here in the story where you did want it to ring true and not turn into something because i think a lot of books do they at the end even with a seasoned author who's written 30 of them by the the end of the page you say hmm, suspension of disbelief is kind of been broken yeah i didn't want to do that i wanted to make sure that i, I did keep it grounded and keep it authentic and just keep it believable. I think it's worked. People seem to, you know, that's the feedback that I'm getting is like a lot of people are saying that they really found themselves in the situations when they're, when they're reading the book. And yeah. I wanted to keep it real. It's just, it's a little bit scarier. You know, if you feel like this could actually be happening as opposed to maybe not that I'm not a fan of supernatural stuff. Cause I am, I love a ghost story, vampires, werewolves. I love all that kind of stuff. But, you know, if, if something, especially if it's affecting real people, you're automatically as a, as a consumer, you're, you're more vested because you've been there or you can relate, or it's all within your wheelhouse of being a human on this planet. And I think audiences, readers are, are savvy. And it's one of the things that I think can make otherwise good work maybe fall off a little bit is is if they fracture the reality that keeps the person engaged in the story that's that's probably the number one reason that a story doesn't work is that you've done something to disengage the reader and nine times out of ten i think it's like you've you've fractured the reality that you've created so it's fine to be fanciful if you're fanciful from the start you know create your world and live but with, live within that world but if you if you're going along in a very realistic, uh, grounded way, and then you know three quarters of the way through, there's a leprechaun, you know, there's the great gazoo. You're like, well, really? <laughs> so you know, I I wanted to keep this very real. I wanted people to feel like, you know, there, but for the grace of God, go I. Like, I could be in a very bad situation in the middle of nowhere with a very uh, unstable, dangerous individual. Harvey Corman voiced the great kazoo, of course, and also yeah. Stan Laurel who did the writing. And what a heartbreaking thing! And, and tells you something about what drives a writer that he kept writing those bits with with uh, Oliver Hardy or for them to perform even after even after Oliver passed away. He would keep yeah. writing the bits. It's it's a very poignant story. Well, they were kind of they were kind of perfect in that regard, right? Because he lived and breathed the work. And wanted to create such an artist with the work. And Oliver was just like, I just want to show up and have fun and be the, the so tie bit. they, <laughs> yeah. So they, there was no conflict. You know, Stan was like, I need to be in charge of everything. And Oliver was like, fantastic. Tell me what time <laughs> to be there. I'll show up and nail it. And then otherwise I'll go golf. And so they were, yeah. no wonder they lasted so long and worked so well. It was like a yeah. perfect marriage. Well, Abbott and Costello had it similar. I'll indulge myself, but with the as far as that relationship was great, because when Abbott goes to meet him and he's really in awe of him, and he says, "Bo, oh, I need you. I want you. Let's partner up." And he says, "Well, Mister Costello, that'd be great. You know, we'll call it Costello and Abbott." And he says, "No, BS. The straight man always goes first. And he says, "Okay." And then he says, "Well, we'll 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 split it. You should." And he says, "It'll be sixty forty." Costello says, and Abbott says, "Of course, you should get more. You're the more famous." He said, "No, you're going to get more. You the sixty. And he says, "Why?" And Costello says, because comics are a dime a dozen, but a good straight man, somebody who's willing to stand there and, and, and let, <laughs> let the other person get the laughs and still get laughs, but in a different way is, is, is priceless. And they kept that 60, 40 for their whole career, which you probably no, know. I didn't, I didn't if, know that. Oh, you didn't. All right. Now no, you're more smarter. Yeah. More smarter. Use that in your show. I'll look forward to it. 
Well, let me ask you one final question here as our set is about to come to an end. And it's about Steve Martin. And one of my all-time favorite books is his Born Standing Up. I highly recommend it if, if you haven't read it out there. And he tells this great story in it about being at the 92nd Street Y in Manhattan. And he's there to talk about art history. It's an art history event. And he gets past a little card at some point and they say, the audience is restless. They, they would like you to do some comedy. And as he writes it, I, I'm here to talk about art history, thinking to myself. And they, they come here all in their tuxedos in this very elite event. And then they're, they're secretly saying, Hey, why isn't you doing the arrow through the head bit? Right. And he says, well, that's the, and, and for me, when I, when I heard that you were writing this, I said, good for Brett Butt, because when I see a comedian and he's going to try to write a novel or a novelist that is going to try acting as serious, even if they fail greatly, I think that's great because they tried and they tried to apply it. And Steve Martin certainly doesn't fail when he tries to do drama. He's a banjo player. But for you, I think for people maybe who in their own minds have that, image of you and they say well what does he know about a novel they're a little bit cynical maybe he couldn't write a thriller that's the that's the corner gas guy that's the that's the brent leroy guy he nothing out of his mind maybe they're afraid to they think it'll take corner gas i could tell you it certainly does not but when somebody says why the deuce should i pick up this novel he should stick to comedy or if they're they're not sure i've told them all how great it is you do it for me why should they pick up a copy of huge and go on this comedy road trip with these three people one of whom they probably would not like to get to know well i mean if you're the type of person out there viewer listener if you're the type of person out there who has the attitude that somebody should just stick to something I'm not going to try and sell you in the book. You know what? Don't pick up the book. Do me, do everyone a favor and don't pick up the book. Just in your mind, have it that I stuck to whatever you think I should stick to. Because I <laughs> I certainly uh, have never given any merit to the notion that somebody should stick to the. And you get that a lot as a comedian. If you weigh in on something politically or some social notion, if you uh if you you know let your opinions go and if somebody doesn't agree with it they will say you know stick to comedy or whatever like the dixie chicks will stick to singing you know shut up and sing um i've never as soon as somebody has that attitude i switch off and say okay i, I your opinion means very little to me <laughs> so think what you're going to think i don't need to convince you of anything luckily the vast vast majority of people are uh intrigued by the notion of somebody trying something new and even if they are cynical or skeptical there's at least a little bit of intrigue and i i certainly felt that with this and i had some intrepid some trepidation myself about you know this is a very very big gear shift but it's not like i'm abandoning the world to stand up i still do stand up i still go on the road doing comedy there's too many things that I want to do and I have too many ideas and too you know, some of them might be good. Some of them are probably terrible, but they're in my head and they're kicking and then they want to get out. And I'm, I'm just interested in getting things out. I'm interested in doing and creating and, you know, sometimes it's going to work. Sometimes it's not. I've long ago embraced the notion that, yeah, like sometimes it's going to work. Sometimes it's not. I thank my parents i grew up in a very supportive environment where it was like hey give it a shot who knows you know everybody fails there's nobody that doesn't fall on their face sometimes so if you fall on your face get up right and uh, try something else or try that again whatever so i grew up in a situation where you, you know the, the the concept of failure is not an option uh it was so puzzling to me the first time i heard that phrase failure is not an option because i really grew up in a scenario where it was like it's a very distinct possibility there's probably a 70% <laughs> chance of failure here if we're lucky, but yeah. that was never uh, presented as a barrier. It was just like, you know, go ahead, fall on your face. It's good for you. Well, I'm so glad that you tried this. I hope people out there will check out the book. Even those of you who Brent has dismissed, uh, I want you to read it too, <laughs> because I want you to, I want you to send him an email and say, I wasn't going to, but I heard about it from Dean. Uh, maybe they read my review when I do it in the New York sun and I did pick it up and boy, was I wrong. Those are, those are nice emails to get, I bet. So please do 
check out Brent Butt's book. It's called Huge. It's his debut novel, but you would not know it by reading it because it's well polished. Please do check him out also on Substack. I was going to say, I hope the book has huge sales. So I'll switch it and say, I hope that the next book, I'm so glad to hear it's coming out. People out there are already loving it. Check it out. Patton Oswalt loves it, which is a really great thing. It's a, a fellow comedian. Nice. Some, Yeah, that was really nice for him to tweet that out for you. People love it. The director of Sherlock and Doctor Who, Rachel Talalay, all these people love the book. You will love it too if you give it a chance. And why not go back to 1993 before we even knew what cronuts were? I don't even know <laughs> what those are now. But anyway, Brent Butt, thank you so much for taking the time to sit with me today and talk with me, even if my wife's going to be a little upset that I said she doesn't watch. This one she'll watch. <laughs> I hope everybody does. Thank you again, and best of luck to your wife. Thank her for sharing you with me tonight for an hour. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Again, the book is huge, a novel. This is really a special book because it comes from somebody who isn't one of the usual writers and yet he knocked it right out of the park. Find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at the historyauthor.com page for this episode. By buying the book through us, you help keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like the usual. My sincere thanks to Brent Butt for joining us and sharing his debut novel, it's full of really solid writing. It builds this tense plot that you won't be able to put down. And for me, just as someone who loves the mechanics of writing, so happy that he was able to apply his talents this way, get something off of his bucket list that he's always wanted to do. Did a really good job. If you have somebody who's read every book of another author, say a Dean Koontz out there and Stephen King, and it kind of gets a little repetitive, they've read the same one, pick up an extra copy of Huge and place this book in the hands of that reader, they will thank you for it. Really special setting, special story from somebody who knew that world in the early 1990s very well because he lived it. Visit our guest Substack, that is the Brent Butt Substack. Listen to him on the Bud, listen to him on the Butt Pod and subscribe there. And you can follow him at Brent Butt on Twitter. Although again, he is moving over to Substack now, doing more and more content there, including his drawings. What a, what a renaissance man, really because he's somebody who can really cross genres, has so many interests. You'll be glad that you followed him on there. You'll be glad that you checked out Huge and that you check out his other works. For sure, I personally guarantee it. If you enjoyed watching this conversation, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and take future journeys in the Wayback Machine. And you can visit historyauthor.com to find my social media accounts linked, as well as over 260 interviews with authors that you're sure to enjoy. Well, that's it, everybody, for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio or wherever you enjoyed this journey into yesterday. Until that next trip into the past together, on behalf of Brent Butt, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Okay. And now Oliver just walked by. Oh, there he goes. look at that. There he is. He's thinking about getting a drink up at the bar. <laughs> Oliver. Yeah.